It's a dirty job, but you never know what you'll find next when you're a cleaner. Modern Times on BBC Two in a couple of minutes. John Peel and the late Willie Rushton are amongst those recalling their time as national servicemen at 10 o'clock here on BBC One. That's after the main evening news and campaign report with Peter Sissons at 9 o'clock. John Major launches the Conservative Manifesto, calling it the boldest and most far-reaching since 1979. He makes a surprise new commitment on tax and promises that more and more people will benefit from Britain's booming economy. Eleven Israeli soldiers are wounded in a bus attack. Netanyahu says no peace talks till the bombing stops. And a startling discovery from space, the Galileo spacecraft may have found signs of life on Jupiter's moons. Good evening. The Conservatives bidding for an unprecedented fifth consecutive term in office today produced the manifesto which they hope will persuade the voters to give it to them. And at its heart was tax and the promise that Britain's prosperity would be spread more evenly. The main initial beneficiaries of the tax plans would be two million married couples where one stays at home to care for a child or a relative. But there was also a raft of pledges on education, health, pensions, crime and privatisation. John Major said he wanted to make Britain the best place in the world to live. The Shadow Chancellor Gordon Brown called the Conservative promises reckless and desperate. The Liberal Democrat leader Paddy Ashdown called the manifesto promises today, pain tomorrow. We have three reports on the Conservative manifesto launch. Our political editor Robin Oakley on the campaign itself. Our social affairs editor Neil Dixon looks at policies for families and the BBC's economics editor Peter Jay examines the economic commitments. First, Robin Oakley on the launch of the Conservatives' 1997 manifesto. Setting out to launch the manifesto designed to win the Tories a fifth successive victory, Mr Major was ready with an encouraging pat for his party chairman. But how did they win the voters' approval? They needed to hand out a balanced package solid enough to reassure when they're insisting a vote for anyone else would be a dangerous leap in the dark, radical enough to be able to claim that after 18 years they'd not run out of ideas. After a moment's reflection in the wings, Mr Major wasn't bashful. It is the boldest and most far-reaching manifesto any party has published since 1979. It is time for change. Time for a change to the next phase of conservative prosperity that will give everyone, no matter who they are, where they live, where they come from, more choice and more control over their lives. Isn't Greater independence and prosperity well. for all, especially those currently among the have-nots, was the theme. With leading cabinet figures in the front row, Mr Major promised a guarantee on school standards, bigger funding every year for the health service. The surprise was a new plan for non-working spouses staying at home to look after children or dependent relatives to be able to transfer their personal tax allowances to their partners. This will make a significant difference to almost 2 million families, adding up to £17.50 a week to their income. This pledge will take priority over reductions in the basic rate of income tax and as with all of our tax pledges, will be introduced as soon as it is affordable, probably, probably, in the second year of the new parliament. The, the party's admen and policy gurus were on hand as Mr Major was asked if the new tax breaks, which won't go to those living together unwed, were social engineering, designed to encourage more to marry. We are in favour of marriage, we're in favour of the family, there's no doubt about that. He reaffirmed, too, that it's a Tory aim, though not yet a promise, to get down to a 20p standard rate of tax. We hope we will be able to do it. What I am not going to do is to say categorically that I know I can do it, we think it will be achievable. If it is affordable, we will achieve it. The Chancellor toured the media studios, insisting that the Tories could find the money to meet the manifesto promises. Over the lifetime of the next Parliament, if you keep proper control of the public finances, only put the money into your real priorities, if you keep the public finances healthy, then you're able to afford tax reductions. 
public spending. But with the relish of the once bitten now biting back, Labour insisted these were wild, uncosted promises the country couldn't afford. They're at it again today, flagging up uncosted promises on tax without the faintest idea of how to pay for them. Just as in 1992, they made promises to cut tax year on year, just as we then saw from 1992 till now, the biggest peacetime tax rises in our history. The Liberal Democrats leader flying to campaign in Scotland today is backing moderate tax increases to boost health and education spending. He scorned the tax cutting auction indulged in by others. When will this tax cut be delivered and how will it be paid for? If this is yet another auction of fantasy promises, a sometime never tax cut, then I don't think the British people are going to believe one word they hear from the Conservatives on more tax promises that can't be paid for. The Prime Minister was at pains to demonstrate he's still fighting for the centre ground of politics. Meanwhile, Labour's manifesto has been rolling off the presses. Tomorrow it's their turn to display their electoral wares. The Tory manifesto didn't say much on Europe. It's the divisive issue for Mr Major's party, with many candidates rejecting the official line of keeping options open on a single currency. The agenda was fresher than expected, but after the broken promises of this parliament, they're taking a risk in highlighting tax. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Westminster. Nearly two million families could benefit from Mr Major's pledge to bring in a new tax break for married couples. The Conservatives also want to make it easier for the elderly to afford care and keep their savings by paying through insurance policies. For those looking after a relative at home, they propose a scheme to give carers a break. There's confirmation of an earlier pledge to shake up pensions, with young people taking out personal pension funds. The manifesto also promises more grammar and specialist schools and offers a guarantee of education standards. On the NHS, the manifesto says that Conservatives would increase the real resources committed to the health service each year, although the manifesto doesn't give exact figures. There would be more medical school places and family doctors would be able to expand the services they provide, such as minor surgery. To tackle crime, there would be minimum sentences for persistent burglars and drug dealers, while juvenile courts would get greater powers. More security cameras would be installed in town centres and public places. But the main impact of the manifesto is its effect on the family. Here's our social affairs editor, Neil Dixon. In the last few weeks, the Conservatives have been dishing out new social policies like confetti, so much so that many had assumed the manifesto would contain few surprises, in this area at least. The year's being portrayed as a recognition that those who devote themselves to looking after children or older relatives give up the chance of a job and with it their tax allowance. It's also making amends for earlier cuts in the value of the married couple's allowance. An extra £900 a year might encourage some mothers to stay at home, especially when the children are young. But not all. I think it's probably a good idea in principle to give women more choice. As far as I'm personally concerned, it wouldn't actually make any difference to me. I work not to make money, but because I enjoy working and I'm also thinking ahead to the future when my girls are grown up. And the traditional family, with one parent at home and one at work, is now a minority. Some children grow up with neither parent having a job. Most see both their parents go out to work. And one in four families is headed by a lone parent. Tonight, Stella Fifton was taking her children to judo after work. But even if she stayed at home, she wouldn't gain from the scheme for married couples. Bang. The Conservatives also believe the extra benefits for lone parents are unfair and they're planning to freeze the lone parent benefit Stella receives and for new claimants to phase it out altogether. I think it's a bit prejudiced really because uh, we're parents same as married couples are parents so they should just treat parents as parents regardless of whether they're married or not. Does your, your father live on his own? The Conservatives' plan though would benefit thousands of carers looking after dependent relatives but again, by no means all. Nearly half of them are actually over retiring age. So of course they won't be helped because they won't be uh, in work at all. Um, and also those who are caring for a spouse, and that's a very large number, won't be uh, helped by these concessions. The manifesto also confirms the Conservatives' radical pensions plan. Today's young would be expected to build up their own funds 
with the state guaranteeing a basic minimum. And the overhaul in long-term care is there too. Those taking out private insurance to pay nursing home fees will be allowed to keep more of their assets when the insurance ran out. In all these changes, one theme stands out. Conservative social policy is designed to help those who help themselves. The state would continue to provide a safety net for those unable to cope, but its other crucial role would be to reward thrift and encourage self-reliance. Neil Dixon, BBC News, West London. On the economy, the Conservatives are still hoping their record will swing many voters their way. The manifesto boasts that Britain is booming and economic success would be put at risk under Labour. The Conservatives promised to keep tight control of public spending and aim for a 20 pence basic rate of income tax over the next Parliament. They promised to stick to the policies which have delivered low inflation with an inflation target of 2.5% or less. On jobs, the Tories will require long-term benefit claimants to undertake work experience. There's confirmation that the Conservatives wouldn't join a single currency without a referendum. They'd use, they'd privatise the London Underground and use the proceeds to modernise the system. The parcels arm of the post office, Parcel Force, would be sold off, while legal immunity will be removed from unions involved in strikes in essential services when the action has a disproportionate effect. And there's a promise to reduce the burden of business rates on small firms. Our economics editor, Peter Jay, examines the claims and counterclaims over the cost of the main Conservative statements on tax and the economy. Once again, the election campaign's in danger of being buried in a blizzard of statistics. One argument earlier today was over the cost of the government's new tax pledge to single earner families. That, it seems, has now been resolved mainly in the government's favour. It was all a matter of who would be eligible. The government said it would cost a billion and a half pounds. The opposition predicted three and a half. The error that the Labour Party made when they produced larger figures was looking at a different policy, a policy that would affect the whole of the married population rather than simply married families with children. But the government has been found out being economic with the truth about growth. On the first page of the manifesto's main text, in a chart entitled Fastest Economic Growth, Britain is shown outperforming both France and Germany by a wide margin. Starting from 1992, French and German economic output are both shown dipping into recession in 1993 and then growing through to 1996. Taking the same starting point, Britain is shown powering ahead steadily in all four years. But Britain appears above the others entirely because 1992 has been chosen as the starting date for the chart. If all three countries are given the same starting date before the recession in 1989, an opposite illusion is created. France and Germany rise for two years, dip into their recession in 1993 and then recover, while Britain dips into recession first and recovers from 1992. By 1996, Britain is making up lost ground, but this is mainly because of France and Germany's efforts to get ready for Europe's new single currency. Closer to home is the manifesto's repetition of the conservative goal of a 20p basic rate of income tax. By itself, this is quite feasible for a party which cut the basic rate by 10p over the last 18 years, while actually increasing very slightly the total tax burden in Britain. If you want to cut the basic rate of income tax, you don't have to cut the overall burden of taxation. What you can do is either raise other taxes, like VAT or national insurance contributions, or restrict the value of allowances within the income tax system. And of course, that's precisely what has been done over the last 18 years. That's how we pay for income tax cuts to date, and it could perfectly well be done in the next Parliament. Just one tax would be more than enough to pay for a 20p basic rate of income tax tomorrow, if it set VAT at 20%, the maximum allowed by Brussels rules. Whoever lives here in a month's time is more likely to be worrying about how to raise taxes than how to cut them. If Kenneth Clark really has convinced himself that Britain is booming, then he'll know that he ought to be repaying debt, not planning to borrow nearly £20 billion this year. And Gordon Brown has said that he'll only borrow in order to invest, which in practice means that he too would have to slash the borrowing plans he'd inherit from Ken Clark by raising taxes. Peter Jay, BBC News, Downing Street. That's the news from the campaign trail for the moment. There'll be more later in the programme. But now, the rest of the day's news. Signs of the essential drama coming up to tonight's nine on tonight's 9 o'clock news. How will Essex man and woman vote in this election? 
We've been back to Harlow to see if voters there still plan to stay with the Conservatives. But first over to Ann Perkins at our Westminster campaign desk for her nightly election roundup. Good evening, Peter. The party leaders may only just be boarding their battle buses, but some of their lieutenants have already covered thousands of miles. And from time to time, we'll be doing our best to keep up. Tonight, we join the Preza Express, bearing John Prescott on his national tour of marginal seats. His reward at the end of the day could yet be the title of Deputy Prime Minister. On board the Prescott Express, the Deputy Labour leader is facing a tour of 10,000 miles, 90 marginal seats and an awful lot of snatched meals. Today it's the Midlands. This tour is the proof that Labour is taking nothing for granted. High turnout is seen as the key to their success and John Prescott's here today to tell Labour supporters, both old and new, that their votes are needed, no matter what the opinion polls say. This is not the usual slick polish of new Labour campaigning, but in the cattle market at Utoxeter, Mr Prescott plays on his roots as an asset. My granddad was a miner in the Wentz Welsh fields, and my dad was a railwayman, so he moved around. His first job is to mobilise Labour supporters who have their doubts about his boss. I think he's a better man than Tony Blair. Why? I just like him as a person. A bit like Brian Clough, isn't he? So to speak to his mind. But this tour is above all about the fight for Tory marginals. To win over waverers, Mr Prescott puts a personal signature on Labour's key pledges. It doesn't always work. Put interest rates on there and unemployment and let's see how we look in five years' time. His ricochet around Britain keeps Mr Prescott at arm's length from HQ, prompting suspicions that he's been sidelined. I go back to London, I do press conferences, I do party politicals, I do also the big political shows as well. So modern communications allows you to do all that. So you're not in exile? Certainly not. 27 seats down, 63 to go. Emma Udwin, BBC News, on the Prescott Express. Within the last few minutes, we've heard that the Beckenham Conservative Association has voted overwhelmingly to re-adopt Piers Merchant as its candidate. Last week, Mr Merchant, seen here arriving for tonight's meeting, was under pressure to resign after tabloid newspaper allegations about an affair with a 17-year-old nightclub hostess. In Edinburgh, the Scottish National Party is claiming it's never been so popular in the run-up to a general election. And its leader, Alex Salmon, launching the SNP campaign under the slogan, Yes, We Can Win, claimed support would rise even further when Scots realised they didn't need to vote Labour to try to stop another Conservative government. No election campaign is complete without some city nervousness, and it's been nervous in the past couple of days. Shares closed down slightly today after biggish falls yesterday. The Chancellor has enraged his Labour shadow by suggesting it's because dealers are alarmed by the idea of a Labour victory. Markets go up, markets go down, markets currently are going down, uh, but I'm afraid there is some sign of political nervousness, in my opinion. This uh, election is heating up. Uh, Gordon Brown won't answer any questions. Seems to me to be a £12 billion hole on his public finances. City analysts, though, say it's because of falls on Wall Street caused by fears about interest rates in the states. And if there is any nervousness here, it's because it's generally thought that whoever wins the election will have to raise interest rates. The Liberal Democrats saw no political connection, and Labour said the Chancellor should think again. We all know that uh, what happened uh, yesterday started in America, and we all know that it is irresponsible and wrong for chancellors or shadow chancellors to make statements about the movement of interest rates. There have been many people arguing, including some Conservatives, that the stock market's been long overdue for some adjustment. Uh, so I would have thought that's knockabout politics, Ken, rather than responsible Chancellor Ken. European journalists based in London were outraged this morning after most of them were excluded from the Tory manifesto launch. Conservative Central Office said the manifesto was aimed at British voters. The journalists claimed it was typical Little Englander behaviour. The Tories said they'd told the foreign press there wouldn't be room. Come on. 
But the foreign press were furious at being excluded from what they say is Europe's most important election. It's not possible for me to go inside, not for the foreigners. But why not? I don't know. I'm not sure that the British journalists will appreciate the same treatment in France or overseas. They just don't give it stuff about us. But uh, if the room is full of um, the domestic press, you're not telling me a, a, a French uh, prime minister in similar circumstances would let in British press over French press, are you? Well, maybe a French prime minister would be a bit more ambitious and have a bigger room. Sarah, we're starting this class. We are all officially credited, but it doesn't seem to make any difference. Don't be foolish. <laughs> Do you want to come through this way, Anne? So there was some room, but not enough, said the party managers. So we all watched on TV. Even so, the Tories' go-it-alone European policy seems to be winning over some of the foreign press. The German economy is suffering from too high labour costs, from inefficiency and so forth, and people probably perceive it as an advantage. But others were still shaking their heads at being excluded. In Russia, journalists, TV journalists, TV reporters uh, are always, all, nearly always welcome. Just as well, perhaps, that there aren't many votes in Vladivostok. And that's it from us for tonight. Peter, back to you in the studio. Anne Perkins. Five years ago, the county of Essex appeared to be a barometer for the way the people of Britain would vote. Essex man and woman seemed to epitomise conservative Britain. Five years ago, the 9 o'clock news went to the town of Harlow to see how it was faring. The Conservatives won the seat. Had the boundaries been the same then as they are today, it would have been with a majority of 1,700 votes. Our correspondent Nicola Carslaw has been to Harlow and reports on the mood of the town now. Harlow, a new town showing its age, 50 years old this year. A concrete creation 20 miles north of the east end of London. It boomed in the 1980s, but it's all changed now. Harlow took the full force of the last recession. A lacklustre town centre and run-down housing estates are testimony to that. For many, the town embodies lost illusions. But while there is reconstruction, renovation, there's still uncertainty about what hope for a lasting recovery the political parties can offer the people who live here. Five years ago, three of Harlow's blue-collar workers told us their concerns. The wage rises are less and uh, things are costing more. Uh, it's, it's getting difficult again. My name is Michael Nock. I am 42 years old. We've lived in Harlow for 35 years. This is how I make my living. I've worked at Guinea Bowes now for about 23 years. The Franken machine and the Frank that uh, is on the envelope is the, what we've produced. Over the last five years, a lot's gone by the wayside, you know, the standard of living isn't as good as what it used to be. I haven't had the holidays that I had beforehand. Yes, we've run a nice car, that might have to change. Health and education are two, two main subjects for me. In the, uh, the last couple of years, I had uh, problems uh, with a liver, which led to a liver transplant, which I did, and it was very successful at King's College Hospital. Equally, for every good story, there's a bad story, and my wife also, uh, three times she waited to go in and have an operation, they booked her in, and on the day actually phoned up and said that uh, it had been cancelled. I would like uh, smaller, smaller classes in schools at the moment, uh, as I say, my son goes to school and he comes home and he's uh, it's raise money for this project, raise money for books, yeah. raise money for the school pool. And that's all raising money all the time, all the time. And that's, uh, it's just a little bit sad, really. Liberal Democrat last time, Michael Nock now intends to vote Labour. Five years ago, those in business for themselves feared for their future. I've always thought that Conservatives looked after the self-employed better or small businesses as such as well but I don't think they've done a lot for small business businesses at all. My name is Dave Hollyoak. I'm 43 years old. 
I've lived in Harlow for 31 years. This is how I make my living. If you fit that in, I might be able to stretch that. Most of the week, most weeks you're fucking right. skating on thin ice. You know, you you actually bills come through the door every week and you're paying them off and you get a cheque and it's just constant, you know, surviving really. Who are you going to vote for at the election then, Craig? I'll probably vote what I normally do, Conservative. What are you mean? Yeah. I've had four jobs, uh, four firms fold on me. It's just uh, a matter of, as I say, survival out there, really. I've got two boys, uh, they're coming up, what, they're 15 and 16 now, and I've always paid for them. Um, but what, does, what the child support agency do, they seem to be hounding the, the, the fathers who actually pay the money all the time. A few years' time, that might be beer. I'd like to see the child support, support agency abolished. Well, I don't saying it. Looking at my I think it's very much time for a change. I think we've waited long enough. The Liberal Democrats won Dave Hollyoak's vote last time. Now it'll be Labour. <laughs> Unemployment's almost halved here in five years. Harlow wants regeneration, but there's a public spending freeze. Before the last election, hard times were keenly felt. Boom and bust. We had the boom time, now we're on the bust. My name is Mark Dangerfield. I am 35 years old. We've lived in Harlow for 30 years. This is how I make my living. I'm a unit manager in a book publishing warehouse over the last five years. We've moved addresses twice and we've struggled from day to day to make ends meet. The key issue to me for this election is the Battle of Britain. We are British people. Europeans are Europeans. We are a sovereign state. We're governed from Whitehall, not from Brussels. If we were to give our government away, then why did we fight the last two world wars? If I could give a message to all politicians, give us the right to vote on Europe. Tory five years ago, Mark Dangerfield now prefers the referendum party. Five years on, Harlow has been through recession and is beginning to recover. In this key marginal seat, workers like these hold the balance of power. They're clear that whoever wins will have to address not just the economy, but vital issues such as Europe, education and health. Nicola Carr's Law reporting. There's an opinion poll out tonight and it suggests Labour's lead is widening. Yesterday, another poll pointed to a narrowing of the gap between the Conservatives and Labour. Here to try to make sense of the polls is Peter Snow. Well, Peter, we can expect the polls to bounce around during the campaign, but the contrast between these first two, published since Easter, is glaring. Tonight's by Morrie in The Times puts Labour on 55%. That's five points up on their poll last week. The Conservatives are on 28, a point down, and the Liberal Democrats on 11 over here. They're down three. Morrie prefers to go with its unadjusted figures, while the other pollsters adjust. And Morrie's sampling was all done yesterday after a difficult weekend for the Tories. So, what's the trend of the polls since Mr Major called the election two and a half weeks ago? Well, there have been eight published since then. And Labour up at the top of your screen have the little red dots. Each of them has ranged from the high 50s at the start there down to 46 in this morning's Guardian poll and Morrie's uh, 55% tonight. Now that red band shows the full range of Labour support each week. High 50s in the first week, low 50s in the two polls in the second week, and now this wide divergence between the two in the first half of this week. Bear in mind that all this can be partly explained by sampling error of up to 3% in each of these polls. Uh, each of them could be 3% three three, three up or down on the figure that, that's on the screen there. Now, average each week's polls and you get Labour support declining a little, but still way above the Conservatives, who started at 29% in all four of the first week's polls, a shade up in one poll last week, and were 32 in ICM this morning, 
and now 28 in Moray. A pretty tight range for the Tories in each period, and their average support, week by week, is fairly steady. For the Liberal Democrats, that first week was their worst since the last election. Gallup even put them on 9.5%. Last week they were up, and this week they're up in ICM, but down in Moray. And there's the band that shows the range of Liberal Democrat support, and on average, as you can see, they've moved up a bit. Uh, and so if you look at all of this, the real uncertainty in all of it is the relative strength of Labour and the Liberal Democrats. The Tories appear stuck uh, on around 30%. So what does all this tell us about the possible outcome? First, the change in party fortunes from the last election when the Tories had a lead of 8% in the share of the vote over Labour. Now, last night's ICM poll suggested Labour had a lead of 14% over the Tories. And in tonight's Moray, Labour's lead is a massive 27%. That represents a wide band of swing between 11 and 18% since the last election. So this is where our swingometer comes in to tell us what swings like that would do to these vulnerable blue seats, these conservative MPs over here. If Labour can shift the pendulum four and a half percentage points over here to the left, then they turn enough of these seats red to achieve an overall majority of just one. If they were to manage the swing represented by Murray tonight, if that happened uniformly everywhere on polling day and Labour achieved a swing of 18%, well then Labour would be in with a majority of 300 or so. The lower swing uh, in ICM's poll would see Labour's majority down to just over 100. That's the 11% swing in ICM. Now, we'll have to wait for polls later in the week to see which of these is the more typical. And remember that the swing at the last election actually turned out to be 4% less than the polls suggested. But even if you subtract that from the best of this week's polls for the Tories, Labour still look well-placed tonight. Now, the only area offering clear encouragement to the Tories in the polls is people's changing views about how well the parties deal with the economy. Four years back, at the start of 93, ICM's figures put the Tories just ahead, 24 to 23%. Since then, the gap has opened up massively in Labour's favour at its widest by January 96, but then the last year has brought the Tories bouncing back to end dead level by the end, uh, by the, by the end of this week are uh, what proved to be a critical measure of the Tories' underlying strength at the last election. Other posters reflect this recovery for the Tories on economic competence, but can it draw back the voters? That's the great unknown, Peter. Peter Snow. And the main election news tonight. The Conservatives have produced their manifesto, which they hope will persuade voters to give them an unprecedented fifth consecutive term in office. At its heart was tax and the promise that Britain's prosperity would be spread more evenly. But there was also a raft of pledges on education, health, pensions, crime and privatisation. And I'm joined now by our political editor, Robin Oakley. Robin, Mr Major's tax commitments. There was talk of probabilities and prospects, but not unless I'm mistaken, cast iron pledges. No, Why? Much, much talk about when things are affordable, and politicians are getting much more careful about their promises, particularly on tax, because they're given such a hard time by political opponents and by the media when they are seen to break pledges. And it was very interesting, Mr Major's talk of the Tory aim of getting to a standard rate of 20p on tax, only an aim and aspiration. In the same way, Labour are talking about a starting rate of tax at 10p, but that's only an aim or an aspiration. It's not a firm pledge like, for example, example, both parties are offering in terms of a referendum on the single currency. So I think electors are going to have to be very careful this time round because what the politicians want is for us in the media to take these as pledges but then they can't be held to account if they don't actually achieve the target at the end of the day. But what did you make of the spectacle of the Tories making the running on tax today and how it will be spent and Labour calling them irresponsible, the boot being on the other foot? Very interesting reversal that we've seen here, but of course Labour have been obsessed with eradicating their image as an old tax and spend party from which they suffered so badly at the last election when the Tories uh, costed out all the Labour promises in terms of what the tax implications would be. Labour have been determined to eradicate that image and to destroy any trust in the Tories as a tax-cutting party. So they are, have had an absolute uh, determination not to allow any raft of spending promises to be built up to allow the Tories to perform that exercise once again. Any surprises tomorrow in the Labour manifesto in the way that the Tories pulled their 
tax plan for married couples out of the bag today? Well, we haven't got wind of any surprises yet. Very personal document, largely written by Tony Blair. Labour have put out these words in uh, Mr Blair's own handwriting, a ten-point contract with the British people, mostly familiar stuff uh, that we know of already about no increase in the top or standard rates of tax, education the number one priority, tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, 250,000 young people off the dole. Uh, but it's all familiar stuff so far as we know. Okay, thank you. And that's the news tonight. Newsnight is on BBC Two at 10.30. That's the 9 o'clock news. Good night.